The ad offered $5,000 and said that the desired activity could be completed in an hour. It stated, fairly reductantly, that it was not a sexual thing, and said that all the witness would need to do was sit in a chair and stare ahead. The only other details expressed were that you could not move during the experience, nor could you talk. This inability being out of a requested self-restraint, not through a means of physical prevention. Being an abysmally broke college student, and having a friend with whom I could depend on for my rescue if something strange happened. I answered the ad only a few minutes after coming across it. The person who had put out the ad had provided a phone number, which I called. Sending a text resulted in me being informed that it was a landline. The person answered, and we briefly discussed the location where the interaction was to be held, and I confirmed the amount of money to be paid. Unlike his ad, he repeatedly reminded me that it was in no way a carnal activity. Apparently, he had gotten a lot of answers to the ad from people with that particular preconception. My friend took the day off from work, insisted, despite my protest that we could wait until the following day when he was off, and we drove to the agreed upon location. It was a house in a suburban neighborhood, which was somewhat comforting. If the man was an axe murderer, there is a chance my screams of terror could be heard by quite a few people. I joked a lot about this, but my friend didn't find it funny. The ad specified and the man reiterated that I be alone when entering the house, so I had my friend stay in the car. Being similarly broke, I offered him $500 for his help. An unnecessary incentive, his words not to leave me if the man turned out to be truly insane. I got out of the car and I walked across the lawn, which unlike those of the other houses hadn't been maintained. The grass was high, weeds threatened to burst through the concrete of the driveway and sidewalk. The man had sounded fairly old on the phone, so I attributed the ill-maintained property to an inability to perform the duties, rather than some indication of insanity. I was instructed to immediately enter once I had arrived, so I didn't bother knocking. The unlocked door opened into a foyer, and connected to this was a hallway that led into a kitchen. The hall held a single door, which I assumed led into a closet or down to a basement. Leftward from the kitchen was a spacious room, devoid of furnishing save for two steel foldable chairs and an equally foldable dinner table. The foyer, hall, and kitchen were in similar states of bareness, and aren't worth remarking on beyond that. Sitting in one of the chairs in the great room was a man, who I knew at once to be the dealer of the ad. There is a certain familiarity about him, one of those times when a voice is an almost eerie reflection of the person from whom it is issued. He nodded and gave a wave, but it did not speak. I approached and sat down at the chair opposite him. To my left on the dinner table was a box. The top of the box was a clear case, through which a neat stack of money could be seen. The base of the box was black, with a timer at its face, and a clasping mechanism which sealed the upper portion to the bottom. It's a time release device. Now that you're here, I will start it. He immediately does. And once an hour has passed from this point, the box will open, and you are free to take your payment. You needn't say anything once that time arrives, and can depart a slightly richer person. Now, all you must do is look at me. You may of course blink, but please do not speak or look away. It is very important that you be both silent and still. And so, the staring session began. It was expectedly awkward for the first few minutes. He stared right back at me. But after a while, the oddness of these circumstances became dull, and I grew accustomed to them. His face wasn't unusual, but it wasn't exactly handsome. Easy enough to look at, but not someone you would have necessarily wanted to linger on without incentive. 
He was about 65, hair grayed and thin, face starting to sag, blue eyes slightly squinting, visual acuity no doubt dwindling. Despite his incessant assertions to the contrary, I couldn't help but think that he had derived some abstract sexual amusement from this. Some sort of staring into the eyes of your lover thing. But despite the incredibly uncomfortable experience of that hour, soon to be described, he at no point exhibited any behavior which would suggest arousal. About ten minutes in, the strangeness of the experience was doubled. From below and then far behind me, I heard a shifting clamor, as if a group of people had ascended the basement stairs and gathered just before the kitchen, chatting excitedly. I was going to turn. The ad hadn't mentioned the presence of others. But the man's eyes seemed to almost plead with me to remain focused on him. He didn't speak a word, though. Resisting instinct, I kept my gaze fixed on him and listened to the noise of the crowd behind me. The weird thing was that while I could hear them talking and even mentally differentiate between the speakers, I couldn't understand a single word that was spoken. They had moved into the kitchen by this point, but none of the words were intelligible to me. And even weirder was that it was obvious they were speaking English. I could recognize the nuance and structure of the language. The man's eyes imparted nothing beyond the unspoken insistence that I keep mine on him. My inability to recognize the words which were clearly English troubled me greatly, and I started saying words in my head to reassure myself that I had not somehow forgotten the language. I couldn't check exactly how much time had passed, the timer being too far out of my peripheral vision. But about 40 minutes into the experience, the voices were right behind me, in the great room. There were perhaps 12 distinct voices, all chattering and laughing and speaking some unrecognizable variants of a language that I had been speaking for nearly two decades. Women, men and children conversed just behind me. Not a single one, not even for a moment, being understandable. I was terrified. Their appearance of migration from the basement to right behind me was strange, yes. But the possibility that something was wrong with me, that I might have had some sort of stroke or neurological slip-up, was far worse. My eyes had stayed on the man, but my mind had momentarily receded, turning over these bleak possibilities. Upon returning my focus to the man, I saw that he was crying. Inaudibly, of course, but the tears were there, the lips slightly quivering. Instinct almost compelled me to ask what was wrong, but I stopped myself, both for the sake of the experience and a new fear that speaking would somehow draw the attention of the partiers to me. And for some inexpressible reason, I was sure that getting their attention wasn't something that I wanted. A new terror dawned then. What if the group continues their movement and they press forward, swarming around us? With each second that passed, I grew more certain that seeing these people would cause something horrible to happen. Their voices did grow louder, but no closer in proximity. I started to shake, my heartbeat quickened, and my breathing became labored. I tried to calm myself, but the presence of those people behind me was so dreadful, in a way that I still cannot find the words to properly describe. Against my control, as I shuddered, I let out a low moan. It was barely audible, more of a release of air than proper emission of the vocal cords. But the man's eyes grew wide with terror, and from behind me for the first time, I heard something that I could understand. Oh, would someone like to join the party? I froze in place. Even my heart seemed to quiet its movement. The noise behind me still continued, but with considerably less people causing it. The attention of several members had apparently been drawn from the conversation. Drawn to me. I became like a statue, not even allowing myself to blink. The man's eyes remained wide, 
but he had stopped crying. He stared at me with what I can only describe as a mindless terror. Despite my earlier belief that seeing these people would bring about some horrible event, I tried to see within his eyes even a dim reflection of the scene behind me, but nothing was reflected, not even his thoughts. I could have sworn that I heard a request to join the party, a woman's voice. I think it was one of dear old dad's friends, a man's voice. Ha, huh, that old fool couldn't keep a friend if his life depended on it. You too sure saw to that. A third voice, another man. There is a chorus of disconcerting laughter which erupted. Oh well. Shall we go back downstairs? The others who hadn't spoken seemed to respond in agreement, although I couldn't understand them. As gradually as they had come, the voices went away, returning downstairs and eventually fading to inaudibility. A few minutes later, the timer beside us went off, indicating that the hour had passed. The man almost collapsed at this moment, sagging back in his seat and breathing raggedly. I went to help him, but he held up his hand, dismissing me. Before I could say anything, he cried out, Thank you, and repeated the same multiple times between breathing. He had started crying again, although these tears seemed to be from relief, or maybe even joy. After a few moments of this, he recovered himself and sat upright in his chair, and gestured to the box and said, the money is yours. You're free to go. Thank you sincerely for accompanying me during this time. For noticing me. Please, take the money and leave this place. I'll be heading out myself soon enough. Despite the utterly bizarre experience, I didn't want to ask any questions. That migratory horde of partiers had scared the crap out of me and I didn't want to remain in the home longer than I had to. I grabbed and pocketed the money, not bothering to count it, and I walked away, waving behind me as I went. I made my exit as quickly and quietly as possible. I closed the door, relieved that I hadn't heard rushing footsteps ascending the stairs. My friend was still parked outside, right where I had left him. I got into the car and let out the heaviest sigh of my life. Guess he was a no-show, huh? Not surprised. No one just gives away five grand. What are you talking about? I took the money out of my pocket and I showed it to him. He looked at the money and then to me with an expression of incredulity. But you were only in there for five minutes. Did you steal it? I laughed. The kind of nervous laugh you let out with someone says something extremely odd or after you had just survived some perilous experience. In my case, either one could have been the cause. I eventually composed myself and said, What are you talking about? I was in there for an hour. The money was in a locked box with a timer set for that exact amount of time. My friend's expression went from one of disbelief to worry, and he pointed at the clock on his radio. I remembered what time it had been when I first left the car and saw that only five minutes had passed since then. I stared at the clock, and then turned my gaze to the money, as if it would somehow reconcile the disparity in perceptions of time. What exactly happened in there? He asked this softly, which made me feel even worse. I didn't want him to think I was crazy, or that I had hurt someone and stolen the money. But to avoid the former suspicion, I couldn't tell him about what actually happened. I looked around, first at the house and the rest of the neighborhood, but saw no excess of cars which would have accounted for the presence of the partiers. Also, it was noon on a Tuesday, not exactly the prime circumstances for a party. Please, just drive. I wanted to get away from the house. Not until you tell me what happened. Firmer but not yet confrontational. I took a moment to consider my options, and then told him a version of the truth that didn't make me sound crazy. I didn't mention anything about the roving crowd of people, 
I told him about the experience with the man, and said that it must have seemed longer than it really was, or that maybe he had set the timer wrong. My friend listened quietly, and once I had finished, he sat in silent for a moment, staring at the house through my window. I thought he was going to accept my answer, but without saying anything, he got out of the car. Before I could stop him, he jogged across the lawn and went into the house. I should have gone in with him, but my nerves prevented me from re-entering. He returned a few minutes later, silently entering and starting the car. Well, I really meant, well, what did he say? It was empty, completely empty. No one was inside, there wasn't even a single piece of furniture. He pulled away from the curb and started driving down the street. I didn't know what to say, and so I said nothing, and he dropped me off at my house without saying another word. I don't know what happened to me in that house, but the money is real enough. I've already used some of it to buy food. My friend didn't want anything of it. I can understand that, I guess. I don't know what he believes. I don't know what I even believe. But hopefully, he doesn't think that I did something terrible. Maybe he thinks I made the whole thing up. Although there's no way I would have been able to gather 5k together. Certainly not for some prank. Regardless of the truth, the money is real. And for that, I'm thankful.